reached the top of the evidence pyramid. So in honor of that, we're bringing you the best in the stat lock series, a high roller heist on the strip. When it comes to the hierarchy of evidence, the systematic review and meta-analysis are our two strongest studies. And after this lesson, you'll see why this is so. To remind you that we're at the top of the pyramid, we've added this 30-story wonder on the strip. The systematic review and meta-analysis are analytical studies. Yeah, they even have analysis in their name. And let these 300,000 watts of beaming light remind you that these studies provide the best research information available to illuminate evidence-based medicine and intensify our understanding of disease risk factors, prevention strategies, and treatments. All told, these studies are pillars of evidence-based practice and are often heavily relied upon as an authoritative source of information for clinicians and non-clinicians, such as NGOs and policymakers. Although many use the term systematic review and meta-analysis synonymously, they're actually two different types of studies. Let's start with systematic reviews, represented here by Statlock's manual, aptly called Principles of Detection. Because when tackling a big case or an important research question, you've got to approach things in a systematic and organized fashion, considering all of the available evidence. The systematic review is a paper that collects all of the available articles on a particular research question. It summarizes the evidence and the strength of evidence that supports the main research question. In addition, a systematic review will discuss limitations, such as study designs, bias, and confounding, identify knowledge gaps, and consider future directions. The meta-analysis takes the systematic review one step further by actually quantifying all of the available evidence. Like Statlock's rather sophisticated evidence board, the meta-analysis uses sophisticated statistical analysis tool to derive an aggregated measure of effect. Whoa, has this heist gone global? The beauty of meta-analysis is you get a global picture. Figuratively speaking, you're summarizing the whole. And sometimes quite literally, these studies go global because many include research from across other regions and around the world. Let's say, for instance, you have 100 randomized controlled trials with efficacy measures for a given drug. The meta-analysis will pool all of these together into one grand efficacy measure. By doing so, you reconcile a bunch of study results, even those with conflicting results, to better match the true value in the universe. The agreement between studies is visually represented with the forest plot, depicted by the stacked bookshelves because with the forest plot, you can basically see where your studies stack up, where the study measures diverge, and where they agree. Notice the vertical plank at the center of this stack? This represents the center of the forest plot, which is centered around the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is usually placed at an effect size of 1, or 0 if you're looking at mean differences, meaning that there is no difference between your comparator groups. The books themselves represent the effect measures of the individual studies included in the meta-analysis. So let's talk about what's going on on either side of the null line. Suppose you're trying to determine if drug X is a better drug. Notice how we've got a positive side of the stack and a negative side of the stack? Well, the effect measure can be less than 1, suggesting a protective effect or positive effect, or greater than 1 which can suggest that drug X is actually worse than the comparator, and potentially even harmful, i.e. a negative effect. And the horizontally placed shelves upon which these books rest are the 95% confidence intervals, which gives you an idea of the precision of the effect measures. The narrower the interval, the more precise the measure is. Remember, by saying 95% interval, we're saying that if we repeated this study 100 times, then we can be 95% sure that the effect measure for 95 of these will lie somewhere within this interval. Hmm, but why are some of these shelves crossing the center plank in our design? Remember, if the 95% confidence interval crosses 1, i.e. the null, then there is no statistically significant difference between your comparator groups. If we think of each individual study as a diamond in the rough, then the pooled effect size is a perfectly polished diamond. And the forest plot often uses this diamond to represent the aggregated effect size for the pooled analysis, hence the diamond placed here. One major plus of the meta-analysis is the power of large numbers. Because you're pooling multiple studies with hundreds to thousands of participants, you actually are dealing with a really large sample size, so you can gain a lot of statistical power. 
There's nothing better to power you up while crunching numbers quite like a foot long. And let this sub sandwich, cleverly positioned right below our main forest plot analysis, remind you of subgroup analysis. The meta-analysis is the study when it comes to subgroup analysis. Often, subgroup analysis fails to see a statistically significant result because they are underpowered. But the pooled sample can provide just the right amount of statistical power you need to see some statistically significant differences in your subgroups. Okay, we've reached the linchpin of Statlock's painstaking detective work to crack the big jewel heist. The rare heart ruby. And this should remind you that the meta-analysis is well-suited to looking at rare, but often pretty serious harms, such as rare adverse drug effects. Often, studies undersample marginalized and underrepresented participants. But, because you're pulling from many studies across multiple research centers and countries, you now have a much broader sample. So you can begin to address potential differences in these subpopulations. While these studies can be true game changers for research, there are a few limitations to be aware of. These are definitely time and resource intensive. The analysis requires some pretty sophisticated stats, so you're often going to need a biostatistician on board. We hope we're not jogging any repressed memories of that graphing calculator you used in high school math class, but Statlock only uses the best the industry has to offer to conduct his analysis. Also, you have to consider that your meta-study may not overcome weaknesses of all the component studies. We're talking bias, confounding, and other flaws found in the study methods. Yeah, even Statlock has some remaining questions yet to be solved in this case. Even though meta-analyses are one of the strongest analytical tools we have in our evidence toolkit, it can be hard to unify all of the heterogeneity between your studies, the populations, the methods, and the results. Remember, science is about lifelong learning and endless curiosity. Keep asking questions and keep seeking answers. The truth is out there. Well, thanks for helping Statlog build his evidence board and crack this case. Congrats, you've now climbed to the top of the pyramid in epidemiology. Systematically and meta-analytically speaking, of course. Remember, systematic reviews are qualitative assessments of the evidence base while meta-analyses quantify the strength of the evidence and arrive at an aggregate measure of effect. You've got this on lock. Stat lock? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, once stat lock recovered the rare heart ruby, he almost immediately dropped it at the bottom of a bottomless mimosa. From us at Sketchy and Statlock Fox, consider the case of the forest plot and rare heart ruby open and shut.